This is part two of a three-part look back at the history of one of drag racing's most infamous creations, John Smyzer's terrifying Toronado. In part one, we look back at the decorated and successful career of John Smyzer in Top Fuel and ended with Smyzer finishing the 1965 season with an idea planted firmly in his head. The idea? To build a car the likes of which the world had never seen and to use it to make a pile of money on drag strips across America. In part two, we're going to go through the process of building the beast. Let's begin. As John Smyzer reports in his own words, in a May-June 1968 drag racing magazine piece he wrote called, quote, Why I Quit Funny Car Racing, the genesis for the terrifying Toronado came from the most homespun of places, his wife. Quoting the story, Smyzer writes, Toward the end of my tie-in with Ray Schultz, I was in search of something else to do, because at that time, although we'd made a lot of money in prior engagements, it seemed the car was taking us right down the well. Reading some auto magazines to unwind a little from my daytime job as a painting contractor, I came across this issue which featured the old Toronado as the car of the year. Gail, my wife, joked, why don't you put an engine in the back and make all four tires smoke? We sort of laughed at it, but I began to take seriously to the idea. I phoned several drag strip promoters to ask them whether if such a car existed, they'd be interested in booking it. The answer? A resounding heck yes. I sat down and wrote up a cost breakdown in the car. My figures added up to twelve, maybe fourteen thousand dollars to build it. As it turned out, the car cost in excess of twenty thousand dollars to build. I got in touch with Lavore Wood, owner of Wood Motor Company in Utah. I met Lavore while in Salt Lake City running the fueler at a points meet. He flew to Los Angeles and went over the cost breakdown with me. Of course, the big selling point to Lavore was the car's capability of making a realistic figure of fifty thousand dollars a year. In view of this, any amount of money invested in the construction had to be a good thing. He gave me the go-ahead. I was inspired by the unusualness of the project. The car was built totally in my garage, and I had a lot of wonderful cooperation from manufacturers. End quote. And with these words officially begins the saga of the terrifying Toronado. What's interesting between the relationship of Lavore Wood and John Smyzer is that it's not really a sponsor-driver relationship. Wood was the car owner and basically a silent partner in the thing. He put up the money to get a chunk of the yearly profits that Smyzer believed could be in the realistic range of $50,000 a year. Now, that translated off of 1966 money and an average U.S. income of $7,400 a year was massive. In effect, Smyzer told Wood that in modern dollars, this thing could generate half a million bucks a year. Wood, after his trip to L.A., provided the car and what would be claimed as more than $20,000 in startup money to have the machine built. The whole car was built in roughly two months. Starting in January of 1966 and having a proposed done date of the 1966 AHRA Winter Nationals at Irwindale, which were slated to be run the weekend of February 13, 1966. The factory-produced Olds Toronado was a sensation when it hit the press. Its styling, 425 cubic inch engine, and innovative front-wheel drive setup captured the media's attention. The car was sleek, very European in its presentation and execution, and looked like nothing else on the road. It was a luxury car with some brawn and genuine technical refinement. It also possessed one of the most interesting pieces of hardware GM had ever made up to that point, the Turbo Hydromatic 425 transmission. This transmission was specifically developed for the 1966 Olds Toronado and 1967 Cadillac Eldorado. It was basically a Turbo 400 with the bell housing sawed off and set in parallel with the main works of the unit. A chain drive connected the back of the torque converter to the input shaft of the transmission to allow it to spin and work. Why do this? A large engine could be mounted lengthwise in the car and still drive the front wheels. The chain drive was exceptionally strong, and the whole package was compact and tight. It's at this point that I should mention the Hearst Harry Oldsmobile and how it was being built in virtual concert with this car on the other side of the country. For the purposes of this video, I'm not going down the Hearst Harry Olds rabbit hole, but these cars were very, very different. The Hearst had 425s in the front and rear, both using the Turbo Hydromatic 425 transmission. It also had a funny car style tubular chassis under the body and a whole lot more tech than Smyzer's car as George Hurst was funding the whole thing from what were his endlessly deep pockets at that time in history. It is bizarre that the two cars would be done at the exact same time and their paths would cross, but more on that in a while. Back to the Toronado and its build. It bears mentioning at this point that there's plenty of conflicting reports as to the physical construction of this car. In the half dozen magazine features I've collected of the terrifying Toronado between May and November of 1966, different names are associated, 
Credit is taken and given to different people in different stories, and the water is pretty muddy when it comes to some of the small human details of this car's build. I'm going to be clear to let you know what the reporting says, and you can draw your own conclusions from that. John Smizer was bound to determine to maintain the factory appearance of the Toronado, so he vowed to make no outward alterations to this thing's look outside of the ride height and the wheel selection. The front end of the car didn't present a huge amount of trouble outside of the header fabrication, which had the pipes leaving the engine and then swooping back to then dump out in front of the front wheels. This created great turbulent air to blow tire smoke around, but it was the rear engine that John Smizer thought long and hard over. Smizer wanted to one-up the Hearst Harrioles in an important way. The Hearst car maintained the stock appearance aside from one important deviation. They had removed the back glass so the injector head and blower from the rear engine were exposed in that area. Smizer wanted no outward trace of the second engine, so his solution was effective in achieving his goal, but perhaps fatal when it came to the car's ultimate performance. Rather than hooking the rear engine to another turbohydromatic 425 transmission, it was set up as a direct drive unit, linked with no drive shaft, directly to the rear axle through a two-disc Schieffer clutch and a Henry's Machine Shop direct drive unit. So to review, the front engine was attached to an art car beefed up three-speed automatic and the rear engine was direct drive to the axle itself through a slipper clutch. Both engines would be controlled together with a Hydrolink hydraulic throttle. But that's not all. In order to get the engine literally inside the car with him, Smizer worked with Britting Engineering to build a rear cradle and subframe for the engine that was effectively hinged to the chassis of the car. It would work and pivot as one major unit. The rear suspension consisted of an inverted leaf spring under each side of the rear axle and a single Cure Ride airlift shock on each side as well. In some features, it says that Larry Gorman, sometimes spelled Larry Garman, and Gil George were involved in some of the fabrication and assembly work on this part of the car, but again, it varies from story to story in their roles and even the spelling of their names. It also says that in some stories that the car was built entirely in Smizer's home garage, where others claim that Britting Engineering did some of the fabrication work at their own shop. Amazingly, Smizer kept the entire factory interior in the car outside of the bottom of the back seat. As you can see in some photos, the rear seat back is still in place. The factory seat belts, dash, even functional cigar lighter was kept intact. He'd removed the rear seat back when he ran the car down the drag strip, but otherwise, the interior was virtually as delivered from Oldsmobile, which is incredible. From the photos I've found, it appears a simple four-point roll bar was used. A hoop behind Smizer's head, a halo, and down bars along the eight pillars of the front of the car. No down bars rearward can be seen in any photos I've ever viewed. A 3 16 thick piece of aluminum was used as a protective shield between the fully exposed rear engine and Smizer's head and body, which rode in a stock Oldsmobile driver's seat. The axle that was used in the rear of the car was a 390 geared unit from a large Oldsmobile car like a Delta 88. Basically, it was the biggest, beefiest thing he could get his hands on. The width differential was made up with different backspacing on the front and rear wheels to maintain the car's outward look. The machine used stock Oldsmobile half shafts that came with the factory Toronado and turbohydromatic 425 transmissions. Apparently, those were so robust that no issues were ever had with them, but early on, the car was fracturing input shafts in the 425 transmission, so from his remote traveling base in Lansing, Michigan at Capital City Speed Shop, some stronger ones were machined, and that was never a problem again. The car was immensely heavy. It's reported to weigh 4,200 pounds in sub-publications, 4,400 in others, and yet 4,500 in even other magazines. Let's just all agree that the car was at least two tons dry and definitely had some extra flab hanging over its belt beyond that. Four Castler 10-inch wide drag slicks were tasked with the impossible job of hooking all this madness to the pavement. All four would be punished in their own special way. The engines that powered the car were a pair of identically built 425 cubic inch Oldsmobile engines. In some reporting, it states that well-known fuel racer Don Radican was charged with creating the engine program for the cars, and in other reporting, it states that Smizer himself was the guy who did all the engine assembly and development work. The engines had racer brown camshafts installed. Valley Head Service, led by the legendary Larry Ofria, did a full workup on the cylinder heads, including porting and polishing, installing 2 and 1 16th intake valves and 1 and 7 8 inch exhaust valves, Mickey Thompson made the aluminum connecting rods and 7.5 to 1 compression pistons, as well as the roller rockers that were used. Mylodon customized the oil pans and created large bottom end girdles used to stiffen the blocks. The crankshafts were provided by the crankshaft company and had stock stroke. 
The engine was planned to run on a fuel mixture of 30% nitromethane and 70% methanol. 18% overdriven 671 Krager superchargers were atop each mill, and they sat on Sharp Equipment Company and manufactured intake manifolds. Sharp also made the custom front covers for the engines, valve covers, and other bits. Enderly injectors provided the fuel delivery, and Hooker made the custom headers front and rear. With a supremely high degree of optimism, the engines were, quote, rated at 1,200 horsepower apiece. This is a number that seems astronomically overshot in terms of what they were actually capable of. Remember, these engines made about 380 horsepower from the factory, which was great stuff, but even on a 30% load of nitromethane and with a 671 supercharger on top, it seems virtually impossible that they would be quadrupling, let alone tripling, the factory output. Here's what Alex Rilordi wrote of the engines in the August 1966 issue of Dragstrip magazine. Quote, The late model Olds is relatively new to the Dragstrip, and Smizer was lucky that sharp speed equipment had designed a complete blower manifold for this application. Krager went along with the job that drummed up a blower drive to fit. The 671s are currently driven with 18% overdrive. Enderly fuel injection is used on both engines, but no provision has been made yet for port injection. The fuel shutoff valve is Mylodon with a close-fitting barrel valve and a single seal end cover plate. If you should keep this seal lubricated, it should last almost forever without binding up. Two fuel tanks are used, one for each engine, with 3.5 gallon capacity each. It's very unlikely that this car will win any prizes for fuel economy with what two engines guzzling about two gallons each to feed the Enderly fuel injection system. Since the car has been running heavy on alcohol, the bug catcher housing gets quite cool, and this causes them to contract and hang up the throttle blades. Smizer countered by adding a little clearance around the throttle and also provided additional return springs at each throttle lever. While the valves were being adjusted, we duly noted a set of Mickey Thompson roller rocker arms, but were, to say the least, surprised at the absence of guides for the push rods or rockers. The tips could therefore ride partially off the valve. A simple guide bar based on the rocker studs or fastened to the head would undoubtedly turn the trick. Racer Brown supplied the cam as well as the valve springs and retainers. The basic block includes a set of Mickey Thompson pistons and rods designed to be around 7.5 to 1 compression. To strengthen the bottom of the block, John added a short Mylodon girdle and then reworked the oil pan to fit. Sharp Engineering supplied the timing cover gear as well as the base for the Hillborn drive and a belt tensioning pulley. The rear engine is set up as a duplicate of the front one, which will pose some interesting tuning problems since it operates directly through a double-dish Schieffer clutch without the benefit of a turbo hydromatic. It will therefore have to put out more low-end power to keep even with the front one until the final shift is made. In this respect, it will be interesting to watch the parallel between this car and the one that Hearst built with two complete Ozobile units and a turbo hydromatic for each. The headers for the front and rear engines were built by Hooker. The rear ones provide good smoke clearing action, while the front ones have been routed past the front cross member and back down. As far as Smizer is concerned, quote, the people want lots of smoke, and we want to give it to them. A Spalding flamethrower ignition system is used on both engines, and there are duplicate gauges in the car to keep an eye on the oil pressure and water temperatures. Temporary tanks are rigged up for cooling, but Smizer has some further plans along these lines. End quote. Alex Rilordi's report is the most detailed one on the build of the terrifying Tornado, and the only one that openly expresses some concern about the fact that the front engine has a three-speed automatic which will be shifting through the gears, and the rear engine is direct drive to the rear axle, thereby creating a situation where the front and rear ends are turning at different speeds early in a run and even partway through a run until the machine shifts into high gear in the first place in the front engine. It would ultimately be a major problem that Smizer would effectively never be able to figure out. As far as stopping the car, the brakes were stock Olds units in the front with metallic linings and Hurst Earhart discs in the back with a 16-foot disc parachute as the final piece of the stopping puzzle. The car's ignition system was actually provided by Grant, who would be a major backer of the machine in terms of sponsorship, featuring not only Smizer but also the car in their own advertising. Now this makes a lot of sense when you learn that Grant McCoon and his father of Grant Piston Rings built their own twin-engine street-going Toronado in 1966. Believe it or not, that car still exists in intact and running form up until this very day. All of this work from the engines to the fabrication of the chassis and all of its odd proclivities was completed almost for the 1966 AHRA Winter Nationals at Irwindale Raceway in February. The car did appear at this event, but it wasn't actually finished. The machine was rolled out in front of the crowd and unveiled as a static item. People swarmed it all weekend long, amazed at what they were seeing, how the whole thing was built, and loudly wondering just how fast it would go. 170? 180? Would this thing be the fastest funny car in the world? Wait, funny car? 
You have to remember that at this time in drag racing history, there was no set formula for a funny car, but one was coming, and it was coming fast. The flip-top Mercury machines would quickly define what a funny car was, but when Smizer had this car out for the start of its life, it was as much a funny car as any other nitro-burning stock body machine the world had to offer. So, much of the history you've read is warped into telling you that this car was wrecked at Irwindale upon its public debut. We now know that this information is patently false. And this is where we start to really pick apart the history of this car and set it straight. The week following Irwindale's soft opening of its career, Smizer talked NHRA official into letting him run at the car at the NHRA Winter Nationals in Pomona. One of the things the car was missing at Irwindale beyond the other details was a functioning ignition system. Grant had sent a pair of hopped-up flamethrower ignitions, and Smizer had them for Pomona, but the car refused to start in the pits. As he reported in his own words, the ignitions were built for clockwise rotation, and Smizer needed counterclockwise. It was yet a second weekend where the car never made a sound. The ignition was fixed, and Smizer appeared on the final weekend of February 1966 at Irwindale Raceway with a car that was finished as best it could be and test-fired. You think you know what's coming next, but you don't. In Part 3, we'll follow John Smizer's two-year odyssey of supercharger explosions, busted blower belts, the occasional wreck, and his arduous journey around the country with the terrifying Toronado. It defies everything you've ever heard about this monster, and as a plot twist at the end, you won't believe. As always, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe for more historical, gearhead, and automotive content.